names on the course outline. <laughs> All right, and I'm gonna press the go live button and we're live. Good day, everyone. Um, depending on where you are in the country, could be morning, could be afternoon and glad you're able to join us today. So my name is uh, Deborah McGregor. I'm uh, Anishinaabe from Whitefish River First Nation. A few days ago, I was in my First Nation. I would be looking out at the water uh, and uh, watching sort of the hummingbirds kind of get territorial sometimes, but uh, but generally, um, you know, enjoying uh, being close to the water on, on, on really hot days. Um, however, I'm back in the city, but really happy to be here to uh, be chatting with uh, Deb Pine. So it's like Deb Squared today, the two Debs <laughs> having uh, a conversation. Um, I'm also the principal investigator for the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project, and we're happy to have you, and, uh, and also an associate professor at, at York University. Um, so a little bit about the Indigenous Environmental Justice Project, which is hosting this event today. Uh, Environmental Justice Project um, really tries to bring forward um, different voices and perspectives um, from community, from artists, from activists, from youth, from language speakers, elders, um, just different perspectives other than necessarily academic perspectives on Indigenous environmental justice, climate justice. And those aspects of those topics that are important to um, Indigenous peoples. And, and today it's really amazing and awesome to have Deb Pine here um, as she draws the links between um, climate justice um, language and land-based activities or making maple, maple syrup. These are connections that aren't generally often made. Um, in a lot of the circles I'm in, in the, the climate change, climate justice um, circles I'm in, th those connections aren't often made, particularly in policy frameworks. Um, and, and Deb Pine's work is one of the only, um, the research that was actually done on this topic. Um, so it's, it's amazing that she's here to share some of her um, insights and knowledge on this. Um, but before we, we, we go uh, get started, I, I also, in terms of land acknowledgement, rather than kind of reciting to you sort of the typical land acknowledgement, what I would just like you to do, you know, as we think about what's going on around the world and in Canada, fire, flooding, drought, all these things relating to climate change, think about where you are. Um, where you're situated and sort of what your connections are to the land and the people around you, um, indigenous peoples and, and, other, um, and other beings that might be around the plants and, and animals. Just think about that and their health and what your relationship is like. That's all I would, I would ask you to do um, and, uh, and just reflect on that uh, before we begin this conversation today. So I'm gonna introduce Deb Pine. Um, absolutely always a pleasure, it's always fun to talk to, to talk to Deb Pine. So, so Deb is from, um, she's from uh, Garden River uh, First Nation and she was actually my master's student while I was at the University of Toronto. And she, she is passionate and loves language, which is so important uh, in, uh, in First Nation communities and in Ishtabek community. And, and she was working on um, a broader project with uh, Wilfrid Lurie University, Brenda, Dr. Brenda uh, Murphy there on, climate change, what's the impact of climate change on maple um, sugar bush, like the, the making of maple syrup, how does one adapt to this? And Deb took this, this totally um, brilliant approach to it. She, she was framing it through the lens of language, language learning, what, how does climate change impact um, language in terms of language loss? How does that impact the practices like the land-based practices? Um, how can it contribute to community well-being and resilience? So. Um, you could probably Google her thesis, but, uh, <laughs> but we're hoping we can publish some of the work because it's very timely right now as um, in, in uh, the federal government policy in terms of climate change, looking at Indigenous leadership. How is this possible without, you know, um, Indigenous people, First Nations, and Anishinaabek being really grounded in culture um, and language and, and land-based activities in order to be able to that forming the basis of, of um, climate leadership. So. So I'll stop talking because we're here to listen to, to Deb and um, yeah, and, and just really thrilled that, that she's here and able to share this work. And well, I should add, she'll be starting her PhD. I realize September's in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So already she'll be and pursuing all this idea around 
um, the importance of language and, and conservation as we, as you know, these nature-based approaches become really critical, but those nature-based approaches are based on, you know, having appropriate and ethical relationships with uh, the land and waters and environment to which language is key to that. So congratulations to uh, for starting your PhD and, and uh, Jimmy Gretsch for having you here. So take it away, Dan. So again, welcome everybody. and hope you enjoy this as much as I always do. <laughs> Chimiguetch, everyone. Chimiguetch, Deb, uh, thanks for showing up. So I called this, uh, my new title is East Baca de Kaolin, The Art of Maping, ma Making Maple Sugar. There's a whole thing around this in my mind, which will come out later, trust me. I'm really into making maple sugar now, not so much the syrup, right? So what I think is really important is uh, for people to kind of get a sense of who I am and I guess what I do or don't do. I'm a member of Garden River First Nation. Uh, my dad was a logger. Uh, this is really, this should be self-explanatory. My mom's from Birch Island, our Whitefish River First Nation, and uh, she's a fluent speaker. So are all my aunts and uncles. My dad is uh, what they consider passively fluent. So uh, he grew up hearing the language. He can speak it to a certain extent. Um, but he also grew up in Garden River. There was uh, three languages spoken in his home. So it was like Anishinaabemlin, French, and English. So he has, uh, he has a really good grasp of Anishinaabemlin and sometimes in particular areas, he can speak at length about laws and kind of um, worldview and stuff like that. So that kind of uh, formed in my mind at an early age. But I guess uh, one of the biggest things is um, I had a really good childhood. Like I had a really good childhood and my parents were really out on the land. Like my dad grew up driving us around by the boat, taking us in the bush. Uh, he hunted a lot. My mom picked berries. We picked every berry there was from, from, the, from strawberries in the spring to uh, high bush cranberries and low bush cranberries in the fall. So that constant being out on the water, being driven around by the boat, being that's just in my head, right? Like that's, uh, it's a really uh, formed how I think about the world, but I don't, you don't really think about it as, I didn't really think about it as abnormal or not normal because my cousins are doing this anyways on the island. Maybe not so much here in Garden River, but in Birch Island where I have many aunts and uncles. So um, the larger side of my family is my mother's side in BI. And uh, my dad only had one sister, so I don't have a huge family and a huge group of aunts and uncles here in Garden River. So for me, um, to go to family gatherings and birthday parties or to go visit on the island, there was just always an abundance of language, right? The, the predominant language spoken was always Anishinaabemwin. And when I really say that line, if you look at my slide, my dad was a logger, this is self-explanatory. So we, we would get tricked as kids and come on, we're gonna go for a ride in the bush and maybe we'll see a deer, right? But you know that my dad was putting the chainsaw in the back of the truck for a reason. Right, like there was no, it was kind of fun. Oh, she does not see my slide. Let me share that again. Better? Okay. So that was, uh, that's some of the stuff that's, my dad was in the bush all the time and uh, kind of the, some of the stuff I got from my parents and when I got older and I seen when I was, uh, my dad always made offerings. He always uh, burned tobacco. He always uh, talked to the trees and stuff before he cut them down. And he talked about why he was doing it and kind of um, he made his offerings and he did he tried to do that in a really like Anishinaabe way. Cause that's how he was brought up. So those kinds of things were always uh, instilled with me. I always seen my mom and dad put tobacco down when they pick plants or medicines. And that was just kind of normal, right? So for me, as I got older, one of the things I really, really wanted to do, I really wanted to be able to speak Anishinaabemwin, right? So I took a program. I have Anishinaabemwin teaching certificate, um, that kind of thing. So that's kind of where I am, where I come from, right? And as Deb mentioned earlier, this is based on my project called Zee Spokutakon, the place where sugar was made. So that's my thesis and you could Google it. It's online somewhere at a repository. Um, Theses are great. This is great because it gives you a snapshot of what you were thinking, but also how to improve. And I learned a lot in this. So like it's, uh, I, I kind of look at it and only see the flaws until I actually look at like all of the language in it, the Anishinaabemwin. And those things, and I think uh, those are really super, super important. 
things to hold on to and ideas and methods. And once you hear it and you hear the stories over again and you visit the elders, it just resonates, right? You hear that language again about doing those things. You hear it and you can, you understand a, a little bit more and a little bit more, right? So I think uh, this was a great opportunity, right? Shout out to Deb for picking me for this because this was great. This was fantastic. This was a great opportunity. So this is where, on this next slide, this is where um, where my grandma's house was in Birch Island, where my aunt currently lives. This is where my mom grew up and where the purple area is. It's um, That's kind of where the sugar bush is. So it's not too far from the house, but it was a little walk up the hill. If you had, uh, if I had a, topographic map you could see there's a little hill you go down the hill here and then it's up back up the hill to the sugar bush here so the zisbaka decon so like that essentially means the place where sugar is made i know out west uh you know more ojibwe territory they say uh the boiling place both kind of terms are acceptable but like primarily in birch island this is what they say zisbaka decon right this is East Baca de Gizis, that month, that kind of thing. So I guess to start off, if you want to kind of look at my masters and think about what I was looking at, there's three main areas of literature. One is uh, indigenous geography. Uh, the second is understanding traditional eco ecological knowledge. And then the third area is Anishinaabeka Ken Dawson. So for me, this was, um, these were big, like theoretical jumps in my head. Because prior to this, I didn't really think about tech or uh, Indigenous knowledge. I thought about uh, the language a lot and, and, and speakers and what they knew. But I didn't, uh, like it was just about, for me, primarily, it, the my own interest was just learning the language, right? And then connecting that to our elders are the best speakers. So, like I kind of did uh, some orthography training. I took standard kind of mainstream classes. But my whole kind of motivation going forward is essentially to learn the language. And I seen this project as another project where I could uh, record my aunts and uncles, right? And record fluent speakers. So, but uh, what this brought me to in doing my master's in geography at the UT was kind of the area of indigenous geography and looking at it, right? Like um, people are doing really, really cool things. There's indigenous geographers that are really right at the front of climate change where their, their whole ecological systems are collapsing, where, where um, global warming is resulting in higher water levels and, and places are disappearing in the, in the Pacific Island nations and stuff like that. So like these, this was really, became really critical and I kind of seen the connection to like indigenous knowledge and climate change through kind of an indigenous geography lens. There's uh, people right on the cusp of um, activism on 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 change and and really it's um it's big field but also like it it took me kind of out of a small place and small thoughts into like a bigger upward lens to see what's actually going on and being part of like like an international group of indigenous scholars or thinking bigger right so the literature in itself is consists of basically like understanding tech what tek is traditional ecological knowledge and uh you kind of only get so far in that right like you kind of get to those ideas where yeah there's tech and science and they produce knowledges in different ways by different systems and it's it's limiting if you're um looking to explore your own uh ideas as an indigenous person in your own language tech is just limiting, right? It, 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 it doesn't, it can't really express and there's words and concepts that don't transfer, right? So for me, I kind of um, struggled or I started to think about what tech was, right? And this is kind of how I got to like where I am, right? I know, I kind of knew theoretically or I knew from a lived experience that the elders know everything, right? I know they vet things in a way. I know they're I know their their knowledge and what they understand is solid all the way through, right? But I didn't, I couldn't describe it in a way that made sense. So I really had to think about what the literature was saying and think about how to get to Anishinaabemwin and the role of the elders, right? So like, you want to talk about tech and that kind of extractive nature of it, like so it can be extracted from the people, different kind of disciplines do different things with this. Oh, we can use this for science. We can use this for 
uh, pharmacy use, we can use this in different ways. And there's that extraction kind of, oh, we'll just grab this and take it out and use it for a discipline. There's that kind of thinking, which is in tech, which I didn't really like. There's kind of that um, um, kind of butting of heads where is it is tech as good as Western science, right? There's that kind of thinking. And all of these answers, basic, all of these things or these conflicts in my mind always get answered by what the elders say, right? Like if I think there's a problem in it, right? Um, I th uh, I've heard elders say over and over again, we didn't need any doctors. We didn't need any teachers. We didn't need any anybody for anything, right? We were our own system, right? So when they say that we're saying we're our own system, right? Without saying that in English. So it's that, it's the scholars that kind of make that jump. Like, uh, they go from tech to IK, right? So IK is rooted in the knowledge of the people. It's from Indigenous people by Indigenous people, right? It's really, uh, it's different. And it's really way, Indigenous knowledge is really great if you want to work across nations as Indigenous people. So we can talk about similarities. We can talk about this place in space and talk at a, a lens of, of knowledge systems being equal across nations. And that's great, right? That's awesome. But for this particular project and this particular time, I was really only talking to fluent speakers from Birch Island, right? So as, as valuable as that is for this particular project, you kind of just go to like a Ken Dosso and our knowledge, right? And this just to clarify it more, just to be right, you know, concrete and discreet and say, uh, yeah, it's Anishinaabe Ken Kendoswan, right? And talking about how that just exists in the language and exists in the elders and exists in their practices and exists in their being, right? It doesn't, um, it's not, uh, you can't separate it. And we know who the masters of it are, right? Because there are fluent speakers. So, um, I was thinking about, uh, like, thinking about things I've heard elders say and thinking about, um, like, why our knowledge exists or, or how it means more. Like, I, it's hard to, it's hard to kind of wrap your head around it in English. But uh, because I had a really good, uh, a fairly good childhood and I was around a lot of fluent speakers, I um, could be criticized and I could be critiqued and I didn't mind being corrected. Right. So I know when my dad speaks or my uncle speak or they're giving me information or my aunt speak, it's because they really want me to um, not get hurt, to do the right thing or to make whatever it is I'm doing be successful. Right. So they're constantly they're drawing upon their own knowledge, their own experience, but they're also drawing upon potentially their relatives or their parents experience. Right. So they're using all of that body of knowledge to vet actions and behavior through their own lived experience as well, right? So it's not done in a matter to correct me, to point out um, that I'm wrong or, or, or a deficiency in what I'm doing. It's to make sure that what's going, what I'm doing or what I'm talking about doing is done in a good way, right? And that's a completely different kind of um, rationale or reason for why that knowledge exists, right? It's really, really important to understand, you know, um, that that advice, that knowledge is meant on to carry on a practice, but also meant to keep you safe, also meant maybe to show respect. Uh, I can think back on my own family, my mom. Uh, my mom sometimes or my dad will ask me to go gather medicines and, you know, they'll tell me where it is or make sure I know what I'm doing. And my mom to this day, she'll say, well, make sure you put tobacco down before you go, right? Or make sure you, when you pick that plant, right? And I think um, if your ego got into the way or if you didn't understand that relationship that those elders are trying to tell you, you might be a little hurt and think that why are they constantly reminding you, right? They're reminding you because they just, you know, they're, they want to give you that advice. They want to show, to remind you to make sure everything goes in a good way, right? So those little reminders, those pieces of advice really kept people safe, right? Understanding weather patterns, understanding how things grow, where they grow, why they grow, where they grow. These things are really important and you have to be out on the land doing things to know that, right? So like um, I heard, uh, I, think it, it was, uh, I think it was my Auntie Jean. 
she said, uh, and I remember hearing that. And I think I probably have heard that at other points in my life, but maybe this time I under fully understood what that kind of meant. And it was that when she was talking in the past, they were talking about the Anishinaabe always took care of each other. Right. Like, and I don't know when you say it in English, it, it means something, but when you hear the elders repeatedly talk about it. So that is kind of like in reference of maybe we're not all taking care of each other today. Right. Maybe we're not doing those practices. Right. Like, and uh, she followed up that thought with another sentence was, Gai, mom was seen, we nagged the wending. Like, we don't come together for today. Like, we don't come together to help each other today in that way. And I think some of that, like, might be true on a whole, but when you can find those families and family practices, uh, which I really seen in my own family, my aunts and uncles, and the way they talk about things and the way they vet things in the language back and forth. It's, it's really about caring for one another, right? Not to get too sappy or too, <laughs> too emotional about that, but that that's really is about, about how they care for one another, right? And that's from a lifetime of being and doing things on the land, right? And thinking about all these things they've done prior to, um, prior to life jackets, right? Prior to everybody's bombing around on a paddling around on a boat, nobody has a life jacket on, right? Uh, all the other extra safety devices we have and all the things to take care of each other, right? Like they did all of these things living on the land and so did our, our ancestors, if you did that as well, right? We, we successfully, you know, navigated and lived in this environment, right? Because we understood where we were in relation to it all. So yeah, those are some big thoughts. That's kind of like what this, uh, what my master's and what talking to the elders and what it does now, it just kind of sinks in deeper the layers of meaning and how they lived. And yeah, this is really, it's really great to do. I'm suggest everybody record all the elders they know if they can. It's fantastic. And the things you'll learn are awesome. So like, I guess to uh, divide it up, uh, some of the things I found, or right? Um, that uh, past family practice, right? So like the idea that, um, that it was a family practice. It was a full family practice, right? We had uh, elders participating in the making of maple sugar. We had children participating. We had uh, youth that were um, able to go up and start the sugar bush all on their own, right? My mom clearly, my mom is the oldest of um, her siblings, like a second set of siblings. There was a, I have a half older aunt, but of the main group, she's the oldest girl. So she, they remember when she was about 13, taking her brothers and sisters up there and starting the sugar bush, right? Her mother gave them instructions and they, after school, they would go up and wash all the pots and pans, tap all the trees, whatever, and start boiling, right? And take care of that. And then her mother would come up the next day to finish the boil, right? Like, so those th skills, like if you think about that today, right? Could you give those skills to, you know, three or four you know, children or, or youth the age of 14 and under, so 14 to 10, let's say, you know, give them responsibility of setting up the sugar bush, right? So by that time, my mother already had that knowledge to tap the trees, to boil, to, to do all of that, right? So that really, really is quite remarkable when I think about it, because uh, my mom is 85 now. So really, she's got about 71 years, <laughs> you know what I mean? Probably their last 10 years, she didn't participate in making maple syrup, but I know she did. Uh, she taught my brother and I how to boil and how to finish the boil without a thermometer, right? To get to the right consistency. So she was well into her seventies when she taught us that. And she taught us it like it was um, like, um, she was following like these perfect instructions in her mind, right? And she's describing the process and what we look for. And no, 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 you don't need a thermometer. Right, you need to use your mind, right? I'll show you how to do it, right? It's like, whoa, what if my mind fails me though, mom? Like, what, like, what if I don't do this correctly, right? And that type of skill, that's uh, just embodied knowledge and doing that from year after year after year, right? So, that past family practice, that was a big thing, right? How that continuity just kept going and kept hand, was handed, right? The initial Ben one, oh, like it's really, really, it's really, really integral. 
but also for the Nishnah Memo, I don't really want to talk about, well, you got to kind of touch on it, but it's the language loss and language revitalization. So for the Nishnah Bemwen, um, I remember my mom describing uh, another family's sugar bush camp was, that was beside, because that area that I showed you in the beginning, there was camps lined up on that side in that one area of Birch Island. I know there's other areas on the, where they do, there are other sugar bushes, but there was a family and she describes um, when she went up there as a child, seeing the, um, she called them wigwas noganon. So the birch bark baskets on the snow to make the, uh, to collect sap. And it was done with, uh, you cut an axe and to, you score the tree and you put a splint in there. She described that whole process, right? So, um, which was really, really cool. And I thought, oh, do you know how to do that, mom? She's like, no. She's like, we had cans and, you know, we, we were already using uh, uh, negamaquan and they call them mace files by this time. So later on, I was talking to an elder. Her name is uh, Gichiksana, and she is from uh, Serpent River. River. Her uh, English name is Emma Miyawasage. So Emma is like uh, Emma's fairly old too, and uh, she was she would be as uh, my uncle that has passed on. He would know her as Gichiksana, and he would tell these stories about her. So when I met her, as uh, like I met her Emma probably ten years ago, and she told me her name I was like that's the lady from the stories <laughs> right like I had this big thing where I made sparks and fireworks went off in my head and so Emma was telling me about the um I told her about my project uh etc 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 or what I wanted to do it must have been after I did my my master's it must have been about five or six years ago yeah I met her and then she talked about um so I talked about those wigwas noggin on and she was like what do you mean by that and I said, uh, oh, you know, the baskets, the flat baskets that they collect the sap in. And she says, those aren't called that. They're called biscuit organs. Right. So because my mother didn't make biscuit organs, right, she wouldn't even know the word for that. So that's like how language loss happens. Right. And not not to denigrate my mother's knowledge or that's just how it happens. Right. You don't you don't use it. You lose it, basically. Right. So Emma kindly showed me in a piece of paper how to fold it and how to make the biscuit de noggins, and she demonstrated it. And uh, that knowledge is right in her hands, right? So that's why I really like admire, uh, you know, the youth that are regating those that knowledge and are doing those cultural practices again and are harvesting birch bark and are making those biscuit de noggins or making the containers to contain sugar and all of that. Right? That knowledge is in your hands, right? It is, it is in by the doing, right? And I seen it, right? Emma snapped that together and she was probably 80 or 81 at the time, folded the piece of paper and showed and demonstrated how to make that, right? So like that to me, that's directly tied to the Anishinaabe Kandasa and of doing, right? So the language, the, the language is an example of the doing or is the doing an example of the language, right? <laughs> it's a, it's the chicken and the egg thing, right? But if you were only ever instructed in the language, uh, it's it's full of that knowledge, right? Because we were always doing something. We're always busy doing something. We're always busy planning for the next year. We're always busy helping each other, right? And that work, Anishinaabe no Kiwan, uh, like our, I guess people talk about it as Anishinaabe Odzuin, like the way we lived or our practices. Um, I don't really take it to the other level. I think where where I talk about the spirituality, only because I think that's reserved for elders and knowledge keepers, right? I don't want to um, say a few words I know in Anishinaabe Bemwin and and kind of uh, promote myself as something I'm not, right? I'm still learning the language. I'm still learning as I go, and I think that deep spiritual knowledge about, um, you know, how the the relationship to the manadok, the relationship to the trees. All of those things that is best guided through our own elders and our own fluent speakers, right? So the other thing I found is really about uh, the observations of climate change and how it kind of plays out in their observations and how it's like uh, like a direct ecological thing that they're seeing because they're practitioners. So um, that's the climate change. It kind of equals ecological change. And I know everybody's uh, talking about uh, two-eyed seeing. 
and uh, you know, using the best of both worlds. And really, it's uh, the, the best practitioners of two-eyed seeing are Indigenous people, right? Because we already have that Indigenous lens, and we already are practice, practice, practitioners of what we're doing. So then we can see both things quite clearly, right? So what's interesting is to think of um, Anishinaabe knowledge as uh, old knowledge, <laughs> right? Or historical or past knowledge or or ancestral knowledge, which is true, right? Like there is, we have a deep culture history, but that knowledge gets moved forward and it's continual, right? And it's handed down by generation. Some of the adaptations of actually making maple syrup and using different tools exist, but the knowledge itself is just, it's reworked and it's handed down, right? So these elders, uh, so my aunts and uncles, they're really like uh, all bang spot on about the day the Sudbury smokestack went up. I believe it was 1972, right? Or 1971. See, like I can't remember the exact date, but they were bang on and they all gave me that number, right? So they were all measuring, like from that day on, they're all thinking about the impacts of that smokestack, right? When the big smokestack went up for the nickel mines, right? And it pushes all of that pollution and then, then the acid rain, it just gets further distributed away from Sudbury, right? So if you go as the crow flies or straight line on a map, however you want to work that out, like uh, Sudbury is about 70 kilometers away from uh, Whitefish River First Nation, right? So that distribution of that acid rain, it just goes, right? And so prevailing weather patterns change where it distributes and acid rain basically gets distributed in a, in a much further geographical area right so we know some of the damaging effects are the the soil acidifies right right the the snowpack level change changes because of global warming right so they're making these connections they're they're watching the news they're watching documentaries they're reading things right so they're taking what they get from the mainstream but also seeing what actually happens out on the land right and it's really, really funny because um, I know and I have known for some time now, like my mom and dad and uh, fluent speakers are exactly right about where plants grow, how they grow, when they bloom. Like they're just spot on. They just carry all of that in their, in their being, right? I uh, took my parents actually for a ride in the spring when things started to grow and blossom just because they were stuck in the house COVID. So we went all over the reserve, all over the back roads and stuff. Hey, eh? my mom was like, Oh, look at there's a uh, chook cherries blossoming. Oh, look at there's this plant coming up. My dad was like, Oh, look at there's this coming up. And uh, they took them down by the river and garden river. And my dad hadn't been there in a long time. And they put these uh, water retention uh, dikes up or to divert the, the flow of the river from the cemeteries. Right. And my dad was like, I haven't seen those. He said, I wonder what that does to the river, right? So it was really, really, like he was really, like he wanted to know exactly what that did to the river, how it changed it, how it impacted the fish, et cetera. Like they had all these concerns, even about as something as simple as that. So I know what they're doing. They're looking at everything with all these expert eyes, right? So apply that to kind of, that knowledge of everybody helping each other, that knowledge of everybody taking care of each other, that idea of that was, that's in the language that this is what we always did, right? So we're not simply, these observations aren't, um, they're not like a casual observation, they're about users of the environment, right? So it's really, really critical to not take what they say lightly. So in this pleasant time of uh, Zispaka de Kang, the time to make maple sugar, right? It's basically Ziguan, right? It's basically when the waterways all open up. It's not like Minokuma, that's when things grow. So the waterway starts opening up. Um, one of uh, another elder I met from up north, um, uh, Northern Man Manitoba, she had talked about um, precursor to tapping maple holes trees in her areas, the black lace on the black ice and the lakes start to get dangerous, right? And everybody talks about those kind of, it's the warming of the trees and the ground that allows to sap the flow and those kind of checkbox things that you could Google and you could find out when the sap flows and how to tap trees, right? But then when you start asking the elders what's going on and what they see, 
it's really, um, I tend to think of things really, really, um, uh, I miss the obvious all the time. So um, people who have been around me are like, Deb, the button's right there. You know what I mean? Just do this. Or So I, I solely, solely thought about um, maple trees, right? And the production of maple syrup and then the conditions. And I start looking at uh, different research papers on like, you know, the overall health of a maple tree and the scientific perspective, right? And then, uh, so I recorded my aunts and uncles and I remember um, uh, recording my Auntie Jean and my Uncle Muzz and she says this, right? And uh, she says, right? She says the trees are all dying, right? Not the maple, not just the maple trees, right? The birch trees, um, you know, and it's because of this pollution, right? It's probably because of this pollution, she said, right? So, so when I, when I got help um, translating a few things from my parents, from my mom in particular, and uh, my mom heard this section A, and then that kind of spurs another discussion with my dad. And, and uh, like, it's like, um, it's like you, if you heard that a group of people were dying, that's the way they felt. Because that's kind of the relationality to it, right? That's how they're related to them, right? That's how they think about the environment, right? It isn't like, um, it wasn't something like they really, really thought about it. And, and to this day, they'll, they'll say that, right? Yeah, remember that thing you did where you recorded everybody? Not that they know that it's like not a master, but my aunts, aunts or uncle, they'll talk about that, right? Or my mom will talk about that. And she'll say, yeah, remember what Auntie Jean said there? And she'll repeat kind of this whole passage or this whole thought, eh? That really means something, eh? All the trees are dying, right? So if you want to think about the whole production or the complete production of Anishinaabe um, maple syrup or Zisbaka de King or Zisbaka de Gizis at that time, we really would need the birch trees, right? We really would need them to make biscuit nuggets, right? We really would need other trees to make the, the splint to uh, the splint to tap, right? We would need all of we need an entire healthy tree system, right? Because I was really focused on just a maple tree for some reason, right? Like I didn't, I missed the obvious, right? I couldn't couldn't see the forest through the trees, basically. So this like phrase really really stuck with me when she said this, my auntie Jean. I just uh, yeah, it was pretty. Yeah, it was pretty good. So this is um, what this looks like. This is uh, the sugar camp in Birch Island. Uh, this is my Uncle Jim. So the big pots and there's suspending poles up top, right? And so I know when, um, like if you wanna, this is really inviting space too. There's usually, this is usually a big family time where people prior to COVID would gather and people will go help out and go eat and stuff. So there, the, some of the, the three main connections that they talked about were the crown damage and the boring insects, right? So my uncle Jim would, he'd said, clearly he said, you look up at the top of the trees and you see that they're just dying. He said, and then he says, there's a bug that gets in there, right? And there's a couple different types, right? There's an emerald ash borer, there's a Asian longhorn beetle that's starting to be prevalent. And I, and, and I know some in the Eastern states and the Eastern parts of Canada as well. There is a maple sugar borer as well, right? So crown, crown damage is typically caused by pollution and the soil acidifying, right? So they're, they're talking about the pollution and the tree health, right? Is, is the soils acidifying, but the soil also acidifies if there is low snowpack. So uh, the ground freezes deeper and there isn't that insulating layer. So it's kind of like a double whammy, right? You have the acid rain, you have the, the global warming or the, the just general overall lower snowpack and the trees then die. They just don't live as long, right? They're not as big. They continually talk about how the, um, uh, the trees just, just aren't as big as they used to be, how there used to be two or three pails that they could hang on it, right? So all of these connections, right? It's that cyclical damage that just eats at each other, right? And it was interesting because uh, we were talking about uh, this in the spring because because of COVID, I stayed home and I everybody stayed home, not just me. Everybody stayed home. Right? So uh, we made a little maple syrup here. And then we started seeing kind of um, all that information coming out in the spring about the gypsy moth caterpillars and, and uh, hey, would that damage our trees, right? And we we're thinking about it. And, you know, you read a couple articles and, 
And the scientists say, oh, no, no, most as long as the trees are healthy, it won't damage them, right? But we know that the trees aren't necessarily healthy, right? They're experiencing crown damage. They're experiencing, they just aren't growing as big. They aren't living as long, right? So I don't know, that might have a, an additional effect on the health of the trees. There's all kinds of ways that this, uh, this particular project has made me think about the connections and what connections to the environmental change, the degradation, the pollution, um, language loss. There's all there's op opportunities to do lots of really different good work here, I think. So um, some of the big things, I know one of the things that we, the other things you wanted to touch on was the, um, like the Anishinaal Bay Okiwin, Anishinaal Bay Odswin, right? <sighs> like these are like just ingrained in me. They're just ingrained in me. And every time I kind of hear elders talk, especially from the island, because that's what I'm most familiar with, is they just talk about everybody helping, right? Everybody helping and learning from an early age, right? And uh, I think uh, sometimes about like uh, the gendering of work contemporarily and uh, I know people's roles and stuff like that. Well, my uncle Jim talks about my grandma always watching the fire. He talked pretty at pretty depth of my grandma always watching the fire and it just had to be so and 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 the kind of his funny comment was that's what the old lady did right I would not call my grandmother an old lady but you can he, that's his mother and he can do what he wants to do there so right like and the work that's involved but the work is funny right because um my uncle also said he's he also took like uh he also is they're really um they draw really hard lines about kind of what the work they grew up doing and the kind of what we think of as work today. So he talks at length about this work not being exhausting because everybody was in it and everybody was doing it and you just kept going and there was food there and that resiliency, right? That just resiliency to get it done and everybody work together and getting it done, right? And that really meaning something because then that product, right, is a way of taking care of each other, right? That sugar, that maple syrup, right? That's like a... That's uh that's the best thing ever. And I and then in, in retrospect, my dad didn't make a lot of maple syrup. He didn't make maple syrup till I was probably in my 20s. And uh every year uh, my uncles would show up at my house and there'd be two flats of maple syrup, right? We had maple syrup all year long. That was a gift that they brought up and gave to um, like our family. My brothers and sisters, my mom and dad, we always had maple syrup, right? That was just like a gift of love, right? Not to get too emotional, but yeah, it was. There's lots of love in that, right? There's lots of hard work, right? And this kind of idea that we always helped each other with whatever we're doing, that just kind of resonates, right? That just, it just is a theme, no matter when you, uh, when you matter, when you record elders, when you meet them, there's always that retrospective look like, yeah, Anishinaabek Penego, Ganad Madzme, Lija Chigang, they Nad Madzme, like they always helped each other. They always help each other in what they're doing. Like, so you kind of have to talk about the gaps of what they don't say explicitly sometimes. And you kind of have to, I think that's what I learned from this. And these are um, like, we probably could record them in that particular age cohort uh, in Whitefish River First Nation. They're all pretty old now, right? But I think like you could just record them forever, even personally, right? You could really there's there's lots that they, they they could tell you so these are some of the the cool things uh i've seen or this is um a tap mark from a tree that's about 150 years old this is the old scar where they would have put the spine in and this was from uh Anishinaabe bay maple syrup producer in dokis so this tree fell down and they use it as firewood and when they split it they found this old uh these old marks from tapping. So that was pretty cool, right? But I think one of the key things is when I think about this is like uh, adapt adaptation with technology. And, and you always wonder like, um, like, is it really, really possible? Is it possible, you know, to take everything that's in the bush and make maple syrup? Yeah, you can, right? You, you really, really can. So my mom, I heard my mom say this one time, she said, um, so this is like, like, this is like throwing down the gauntlet when you hear somebody say that. It's like, whatever it is that you want to 
that you need is there. So I heard this, right? And, you know, you could make the biscuit day noggins. You could probably make the, the splints. I could probably tap it traditionally like that. But uh, I really searched hard for this presentation to find an example of this. There's, um, I do believe it's on, uh, it's on uh, Dengue Mazinigam Facebook. I'm pretty sure I seen it in the spring. It was uh, Gun Lake Tribe, a Potawatomi tribe in, uh, in Michigan. They sugared and they boiled their syrup in uh, clay pots. So I remember um, meeting or knowing, I, I went to school with uh, Punkin Shenaniquit, Punkin's from there. So Punkin is uh, revitalizing their family's revitalizing practices. I know they make, uh, they use and process Benagaziganuk uh, hominy corn. But that idea that you're um, making, using everything out of the, out of that, that's there to use. There's everything here for you to use to do this practice. This is awesome. So um, one of my other cool friends is uh, Amber Sandy. She's doing a lot of different work now with uh, fish tanning. You might've seen her on Dengue Mazinigan um, doing fish tanning workshops, but she sent me this picture. Um, Smithsonian has huge collections on indigenous peoples and artifacts. So every year they dedicate a year to, it's either the, the year of the Anishinaabe Bay or it's the year of the Choctaw. And then they have an open application for um, communities to come and visit those artifacts. So Amber did this while she lived in Toronto and she took a whole bunch of Anishinaabe Bay elders to the Smithsonian and they got to see all of these artifacts. And uh, this, these are duckbill molds, the sugar molds. So this is super, super cool. I show, I showed this to my friend, a young friend of mine, and he um, actually made one. He actually made one this year and uh, give them a shout out. They're uh, Great Lakes Cultural Camps. So they're also on Dengue Mazinigan. I say, I say Dengue Mazinigan like uh, my friend Cotney Caboni does. She always does that every time she says Facebook. So shout out to Cotney. Uh, yeah, so this is like the revitalization of the practices, the revitalization of the words that go with it. But also the sugar bush is set up to be a super awesome immersion camp, right? Because it takes so time, such a long time. You can be there for two or three weeks doing it. There's the setup, the actual boiling, the collecting, the gathering, you know, that you can bring fluent speakers up and have people learn to do the work and stuff. This is like set up perfectly. This would be like a dream of mine to do, to have like a sugar bush immersion camp. So this is... Um, some of the big things that I was thinking about in kind of retrospect and uh, had some interesting thoughts about it on this number one in climate change, right? Like activities will be lost. We'll, we'll change or be lost, right? We'll have to modify them, right? Um, some of the things, the way you can modify them, right? We, we used to adapt when degradation occurred, right? We'd move, right? We'd have this ability. We know our reserves are locked now, but Really, there are open spaces called crown land, you know, we, where we can continue our cultural practices where we do have a right to, right? There's a potentiality for that. Um, we'll lose the language around those activities if we don't continuously do them, right? We'll, we'll forget what a biscuit de noggin is, right? We'll forget how to, if the birch bark trees aren't big enough and they don't grow big enough, we won't be able to harvest them right? Harvest enough birch bark to make those biscuit and organs, right? So like, that's kind of where that's going, right? If things aren't changed, but there's a really cool, I, uh, what I like about going to school too is also is um, the stuff you would learn if you'd never read this article. So as much as I hate reading articles and doing that type of work, because that it is, uh, it is, it is a little bit of a work, right? There's a cool article. I'll show you. Um, this is from uh, an article from Ian Davidson Hunt, and it was about uh, the sugar bush being relocated to Shoal Lake. So they didn't have uh, maple trees up there. They didn't have an cook. So they really, they transplanted them. And uh, it goes into some length about the description of the process and how they sheltered those trees. But basically they transplanted the sugar bush further north than it is, right? Because if you blow up the highway here where I am, I'm in Garden River First Nation. If you go up towards Thunder Bay, you can see the trees change, right? And that changes what to the boreal forest, right? where it's, there's no maple, maple trees grow, right? So we have the knowledge to do this, to alter our environments, to live with our environments, right? We didn't need any... 
we didn't need any teachers. We didn't need any, we didn't, we could do that ourselves. So I do believe that knowledge exists. And some of it, sometimes I think about it in the bigger, like Anishinaabe nation context, where we're in our, our bigger language family, right? And we have that knowledge that can be passed and shared. It's, it's going to take uh, some adaptation and technology is going to be our friend and all of that. But I do think there is, um, like, if we can have uh, elders really sharing fluently in the language, places and techniques and things, I think, I don't think that's without, with, not within our reach, right? Um, so once again, I just always got to go back to the elders. Like there's, there's, they're super important, right? Kachapita and Dog, Kachinishnabek, right? They have, um, they have this knowledge, all this knowledge that they want to share with us and we have to be willing to receive it. But the best way also to receive it is if we can acquire the language and be fluent, right? We can understand really what they're saying and really take that, take that information and move it forward. I remember, um, uh, I was thinking of, uh, uh, Luigi Ba Deb, when he tuned me up at, uh, I presented at Anishinaabe Ben Niwin with Deb, and uh, Deb was awesome. She basically let me present and then just left me hanging out there. I was like, there was like three thirty fluent speakers in that room, and uh, Louis Ba stands up and he tuned me up. He didn't really like the term that that I used the word uh, get kayak. There's a couple different words for like elders. Some people say get kayak, some people don't, some pay, people say get you a yayak, the older being, some people say get you a back. So he told me not to use that word. He basically got up and said, Gangi Kitsiwe Kwezens, he called me. He said, don't say that little girl, right? So, but that was done out of respect, right? Like he did that to help me. I don't, I don't think he did that to embarrass me in any way. And I think it's, uh, I, what I've learned from this experience is, uh, I've learned really how to engage with my own family to really kind of uh, develop good personal relationships with them. And, and for some people that would mean a lot of personal work, right. Uh, healing in our own families and our own, and our own being right from different things that have happened to us. But I think if you can do that, and if you have access to elders that are fluent, that are in your family, uh, like take that time and opportunity to learn from them and, and record and document and, and, and do these practices. So why I, I really called um, why I really called this presentation uh, de Kewin, the art of making maple sugar is so I made we made I made a gallon or two gallons of syrup and um, about two liters of uh, sugar and that's just from tapping six trees around my house, literally right around my house. So uh, I got my dad, my dad lent me some of his older equipment. Um, he came and checked out the setup, even though he is 80, he drove his truck up and he checked it out and gave me some pointers and, and uh, we finished. I actually had uh, asked my sister to help me finish who actually finishes the syrup, right? Like she knows how to do that for my mom. Like I was mostly a hauler of the sap, pile the wood type cat, right? Like I'm a, I'm a, that kind of helper, right? So, but I had seen my mom do it. So, but I'd asked my sister because I was a little nervous because we're making it on our own. My sister, she um, uh, had a bug or she was unable to fulfill her duties as the syrup or finisher. So <laughs> we and my friend Bunny were boiling and we boiled at the wrong time. We finished at like, I want to say around 3.30 in the morning and we got this big pot and we're tired and I was like, hey, pull it off. I'm pretty sure that's it. Like, I'm pretty sure, you know, it's it. We got to pull it off, right? Pull it off the fire, bring it in the house. And uh, my sister was really under the weather. I did wake her up. I was like, I'm just going to wake her up. I woke her up and she came out and she grabbed the stick and the wooden spoon. She put it in the pot. Yeah, that's right. Put the pot and went back to sleep. <laughs> right? So I was like, yeah, we did it. Take care of it. Let it rest. Do all the sorting, do all the cleaning of it. And now, uh, when kind of the COVID restrictions opened earlier up, I traveled to the island to see my aunts and uncles. And so my uncle Ed, who's on the far left, um, they're all like master boilers. Like they all finish, my uncle Muzz finished. My uncle Muzz has his own little camp, but they're all master boilers. They can all finish and complete the process, do it all. So he said he had a similar problem where they had to reboil. And so he showed me a jar of his syrup and he gave me a jar to take home and my syrup, I put them side by side and they look exactly the same, which I was really, really proud of. 
But the one step different thing I always wanted to do is my mom would talk about how my grandfather always made maple sugar and he always made enough for the whole year to put in his tea. So the second boil, I made maple sugar. We made about two liters of it. And so we were talking, we were chit-chatting or whatever, eh? and me and my uncles when I was on the island, and I said, but uncle, I made maple sugar. And you can't really surprise these guys, like, because they've seen everything, they've done everything. So he kind of looked at me and he smiled. He was like, you made sugar? <laughs> right? And I was like, yeah. So so he said, you know, he, he smiled and that was it. And then he went into the living room and uh, he talked to his brother, my uncle Maz, eh? And then they were on Anishinaabe Todd's walk. They were talking the language to each other, eh? And, and I could hear my uncle Ed say, hey, she made sugar. Debbie made sugar. <laughs> so they had a conversation in the language about me making sugar. And like, that's what I'm going to do more of, right? I'm going to do make more of because it's, for me, it's a, it's a more usable product. Like I can use it in my tea. I'm not really a big pancake eater to begin with so this would be this is that's what I want to do next year and I want to put a little more thought into it and maybe make a little bit more of it but yeah like uh I don't know like I think uh I think that's what you do and this is the opportunity I had to to learn about this stuff and I I really don't think that I would have done this had I not did a master's on it like I might have I do have the knowledge of it but I don't know that I would uh, it would have kind of ignited me re-engaging with my family recording them as much as I did and really talking about them, talking to them, talking with them and talking about making this stuff. Cause it, it just opens the door to other, having other conversations. Right. So Jimmy Gwetch, everybody for listening. And uh, I know Deb wants to jump in and say things. So let's have a discussion. I don't know if uh, any um, listeners or viewers have um, have any questions. That's great, Deb. Like, actually, yeah. Like, since you finished, you've you continue. Like, the the really interesting thing about this is you didn't like stop as soon as the thesis was done. You continued to learn and do stuff and and still engage. Probably one of the, I suppose you could say, advantages of um, of uh, engaging in, in uh, research with your own family and community because it's not like you leave and then you're gone. You can still continue to build upon um, uh, build upon the knowledge. Um, yeah, I really like the example what Emma uh, Mawasage, like just yeah. uh, again, um, speaking, uh, speaking to how people might know the language, but you may not necessarily connect it to the specific practice and you don't want to um, don't want to lose those, um, lose those either. I did want to ask you about um, how you see how you see this connected to Anishinaabek resilience in the face of of climate change. Like, what sort of like how do you see um, working in the working in the sugar bush, engaging with language, engaging with others, is helping navigate through? You know, think about what we're facing in the country. Um, the practice that the uh, Show Lake did. Like, how do you see how do you see this helping people sort of negotiate and navigate? Um, you know, maybe some uncertainty in terms of what's to come. I think um, like the language is key, right? We have to understand the practices, and that practice is kind of like uh, you're apprenticing for a bigger job. Once you do all of these things and you know all the things and you're continually kind of making offerings and, and praying and doing cyclical things, not just in the sugar bush, right? Because that leads to another knowledge set, you know what I mean? Where you're, you know, harvesting fish or you're harvesting berries, right? And there's, you're continually making these offerings and, and doing things in a Anishinaabe way. I think you, you get access to the deeper knowledge, right? I think that, uh, you know, I think I've, I've heard uh, different scholars, different Anishinaabe scholars talk about it and elders and talk about like that deeper set of knowledge that really guided us, right? There's the practices that sustained our life, but then there's kind of that uh, Anishinaabe odds win, that kind of next step. And I think that um, that's what really is the backbone of our resiliency, those relationships to the Manadok. And I don't really like to talk about it in that way because I'm not, uh, not a fluent speaker. But also that that's a very personal relationship that you have. And I think that's what, what is really bringing us all together, right? And it makes us resilient, right? It makes us believe in ourselves. It makes us uh, feel good about ourselves. And it makes us reach our potential in a different way. Because it sets us up with all this kind of um, 
respect and kindness and love and these kind of foundational things that we may have been missing. And we, we lose that in a, in an English context. And when we think when we live in a mainstream society, but if you can do that, it changes your mind and it makes you, it makes you more resilient, right? It makes you, makes you able to survive um, and diversify and adapt and, and really seek out answers in another way. I think some of the skills, like even just the practical skills of applying what you know here from the sugar bush to, you know, setting net to like not over harvesting, to not over tapping, to not um, like some of the other, the, the other things, I guess, that frame this are like uh, really my, um, my uh, aunts and uncles are real adamant about not um, using vacuum lines in the sugar bush, not adapting to that next kind of technological level of where, where it's about production, right? How much sap you're getting or whatever, right? So really there's, there's not a lot of um, science on why or, or if vacuum pumping the trees is that bad, is, is bad for the tree, right? And the reason why there isn't that, as I talked to a guy from OMSPA, I think he was the ED at the time from the Ontario Maple Syrup Producers Association. He said he had asked for a stand of 50 trees. He said, I want a stand of 50 trees tapped old school with a spile in a, in a pot. And I want 50 trees vacuum tapped, right? And using the tubes and everything. He said, and I want the, the health of them measured, like give it, give them 10 years, give them 15 years, right? To really measure that, right? And he said, you know, he said, uh, they're, they won't do that. They won't do that because they don't want to prove that, like that hurts the tree, right? But if it hurts the tree, then it, it hurts the entire process and all the producers, right? And all that, like the environment in general, right? Like, so I, I know that when they stop at a certain level, like they're really adamant about not not doing that because there is like a, like, a, like it's some of it's common sense. Some of that resiliency is common sense, not to take too much, right? That's an ethic, right? An Anishinaabe ethic, right? Not to take too much. And when you take too much, like kind of all of our stories or our legends, there's always a story about something bad happening, right? Like nothing good ever happens after you take too much, right? So <laughs> this is like, but it's hard to, to talk about, talk about it in a concrete way, I find. Like you have to be in Anishinaabe and I, I know it's just better revealed in the language, right? Like I don't want to dodge it, but I don't have the right uh, context for it, right? And I think that question would be awesome to ask some fluent speakers. Oh, I think you did a great job. Like some of the things that I noted is the whole idea of um, working hard. I remember that was one of the key findings is, you know, a lot of the... Um, the, the literature on traditional ecological knowledge or even indigenous knowledge doesn't really address that. Like it, it, it's so abstract and conceptual, people actually don't really know, let's say how to do it, right? And, um, but, uh, but part of it is um, a key aspect of it is being able to help each other and take care of each other. Um, that really isn't talked about in the climate change uh, resilience world in Indigenous people. Um, love isn't part of it. In Indigenous context, it always is. I've said this, if people have listened to the other talks that we've done, always comes up. But you know, when I facilitated the youth elders gathers on climate change, they talked about it all the time. This taking care of the earth, taking care of each other. Uh, Dan Longboat really stressed that as well. That's, that's actually key to climate change resilience. But I, when I go into the climate change policy circles, like mainstream, they don't talk about that. So, so to me, that's how language and uh, or for what I've learned from you and and being in, in the sugar bush does. It teaches people those things that um, you know that don't feel capitalism. Let's say um, about helping and taking care of each other, and and it bu builds these other values that actually. Um, contributes to the resilience because, as you pointed out in some of the stories, that's kind of what got people through challenging times and environmental change, um, change in the past. So I think that's, um, yeah, that's really important. Um, the, the other thing I really liked about what you said, I don't remember this again coming out, or maybe it did. I'd have to kind of read the thesis again. And my dad, I remember my dad saying this because we have our family sugar bush too, is there had to be other trees around. It wasn't just the maple trees that were important. He says the birch um, like to hang out with other trees. Like he just said, certain trees were friends with each other and they helped each other. So even within that, the tree world, there was those values as well. Like certain ones needed to be there in order to, or order to help each other. And, and recently actually, while I was 
up north in, in BI, I was walking around in the bush and I could really see um, the impact on the birch, like literally, like, cause they grow, they tend to grow together, like three or four of them, they, they're just plopped right over and they don't get really big. And, and I was saying to um, family members, I said, at one time we spilled the, like, could you make a canoe out of that? Like, it would be so hard to do it now because the trees just aren't growing and their health, they're just like plopping over, even though other trees are there. And so, so they, so some of the trees also need to kind of have their own, as my dad said, their own friends. They like, they like to hang out with certain, with certain, um, certain other trees. So there's so much, there's so much eco, like the ecological knowledge embedded within this as well. Um, that's, um, that's really important. So, um, yeah, no, I, those are sort of like my, um, my main comments that I, that I just wanted to highlight. Um, Deli, I don't know if there's any questions that are coming from, um, from folks. And I, I think the only other comment that, that I would make too is, um, <laughs> just cause I was asked this, I was peer reviewing a paper or sorry, I was writing a paper and one of the, and it was basically the difference between indigenous knowledge systems and indigenous knowledge because people are using them interchangeably, but they're not the same, like the systems you're with and the systems you're with and the society. It comes with a set, set of assumptions. Like you were saying, we are a society that had everything we needed to be who we are, right? As opposed to knowledge being extracted, um, e extracted from communities. But then I was asked, what if people um, are kind of learning this kind of stuff abstractly, right? By maybe watching the video, this video or reading stuff. Like, do they actually really know Inishtabek and Daswin? Like, do, and I just said, no, because <laughs> you kind of have to, and you, you kind of have to have the, the practice, but people don't want to hear that because quite frankly, most, you know, Indigenous peoples are urban contexts and they don't have access to this for all kinds of reasons, right? So, but that's not a popular thing to say. Um, and uh, anyway, I ended up saying that's too big of a topic to talk about for this paper, which was basically critiquing federal policy on developing an Indigenous knowledge policy and uh, and not knowing the difference between Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous um, Indigenous knowledge systems. But I think those are further conversations to have because um, that's been my experience as well. What you've talked about, then how do you create opportunities then for people to actually like go from like knowing something in an abstract kind of conceptual way to actually kind of knowing it, as you were saying, like like literally the knowledge is in the hands, like how you actually do things. So I don't know if you wanted to, to comment on that, but um, but those are really sort of like big questions going on right now in the field. Like, how do we, how do, we do this then? If that's what you think. There's a lot of people who disagree and don't think that at all, but that happens to be what I think based on growing up very similar to the way you did and kind of knowing the difference between abstract and conceptual versus kind of knowing what your hands are, knowing what your body. I think there's uh, probably bigger institutional solutions or community solutions, but personally, I think um, people have to um, like uh, walk the walk, right? You know what I mean? They really have, you really have to go talk to elders, right? If you have a commitment to learning the language, right? You really got to go meet elders, right? You really have to go to them and be a part of their lives, be a part of their lives in a meaningful way, right? Understand that um, you could be washing somebody's windows while they're talking to you in Anishinaabemwin, right? Like you could be a part of their lives. I think the idea that sometimes the language is a commodity as well, and people, they want to take the class or they want to get by the book or they want to do the different things, right? But like the really, if it's in the people, then you'll get all of this kind of this knowledge anyways. And it's about having that relationship and engaging in that relationship in an appropriate manner. And I think that um, probably you and I and others of our age or that age range, we grew up really similarly respecting elders and having to listen to them and, and having to follow instructions and stuff like that. And so now as an adult, like, I don't, I don't think that's a big deal if I go visit my aunt and she asks me to clean out her bathroom. Right, or she asked me to go do something. I don't think of that as a big deal, or I don't think that as a, I think that is as just as being a part of somebody's life, right? And I think if like community wise, I think if you really want to keep the practice alive and you really want to throw some funding around, it'd be nice to do this. Is, the sugar bush is set up for an ideal place for an immersion, right? A two week immersion, a three week immersion, right? You could even take that whole month if you wanted to, right? You could be learning practices and, and engaging people. And what I find now is there's a lot of people that um, it's easier to gain the skill of like, let's say uh, making uh, one of those birch bark cones that they store the 
sugar in because you can YouTube that, right? You can YouTube it, you can stop it, you can pick it up whenever you want to. You know, you you can do that in a kind of a, a real tech savvy way where you don't need a person. But if you could bring those people in that are developing that expertise and pair them with fluent speakers so they don't have to do so much work, right? There's ways to do it. But you just have to think about like outside of the, the mainstream what's going on. But it, it, when all else fails, uh, just go see an elder, right? Go find a fluent speaker if that's what you want, if you really want to regain the, the knowledge of all of this. And it it's a, it's a different way of putting yourself out there, I think. And we're not often, if you weren't raised in that environment, it's a different skill to, to acquire. But once you acquire it, I know all of the, the people that I've talked to and that have done that, they just, they're like, yeah, you're right. I should have been visiting these old people along. I should have been seeing these old speakers. I should have been visiting the speakers, right? It just took my language learning to a next level. I have friends we visit, right? Um, and think of people as um, like real people, right? Like real speakers have real lives. It's not, it's, it's, uh, it's, they can just do all these things, which is utterly amazing to me, right? Like my uncle uh, Lawrence or Mazai, as he's affectionately known, he, uh, He's 83. I think he's two years younger than my mom or three years younger than my mom. He's either 82 or 83. He's still working this summer. He's still doing stonework. He was talking about all the things he's building. He had to fix. And uh, sometimes he, speak, he was speaking the language to me. Sometimes he wasn't. Hey, you understand me? You still understand me what I'm saying? And he'll switch to English every now and then. But like, if somebody wanted to learn stonework or mason work, like he'd gladly take on an apprentice. You know what I mean? Like there's just, it, uh, I think what we think of it as separate, but you really think of the language as people, right? Because you could, you have all this space now where it could just be um, books and it could be resources and things, right? But who's going to talk back to you, right? You really have to really live in a community if you want to be a speaker. Sounds great. So we're getting like thank yous uh, from far, from far away. Um, I just wanted to just give you the last word on this before we end for for the day. So uh, Chimigwech and all of this is. Um, what do you see yourself doing in the next year? The next five years? You're starting a PhD. Language is going to be core. How does this relate to to laws? Con like, however, I always call it. I don't think about conservation the way I guess, you know that might be in Parks Canada's kind of website kind of way. Like, how, like where, do you, where do you see you taking this now? Like you've learned a lot and you learned a lot even after, like you've continued on with the learning. Like, where do you see, where do you see this going? I think the end game is never any more English for me. No, just kidding. <laughs> That's the ultimate end game of any language learner, right? We just want to live in the language. But I think, uh, I think about some of the um, really big, uh, sites where they're doing really good work in Anishinaabe territory, like the UNESCO site, the Pamachki, Pamachuan Oki in uh, Northern Manitoba. Like that's amazing, right? Like I think there's lots of uh, like uh, nation to nation or nation building in amongst Anishinaabe one speakers, Anishinaabe Pemjik. I met uh, a girl about four years ago. She's from Barrier Lake. Uh, she's younger than me. She's totally fluent in Anishinaabe. She speaks English and French. So I don't, I think we're, um, people have to conserve, think of like conserving the language and revitalizing the language goes great with the land. I think I have a few things to think about, but for me in my heart and in my mind, it's always language first, then land, and then conservation. <laughs> so I have to make that uh, a little soup out of that and figure out what I plan on doing. Because <laughs> the, the, really the end game could just be that I'm fluent and then I'm helping to always, uh, you know, revitalize the language and, and work to teach in that area, right? Uh, or teach, like, that kind of the real goal is um, a, lot of, a lot of fluent speakers or a lot of teachers that I've had, I've talked about, um, when are we going to have teachers that teach in the language, and don't teach the language, right? So like, when are we gonna have geographers that teach in the language, right? And they're just teaching geography in the language. When we have full universities, full institutes, right? Where people are just teaching their subject matters in the Anishinaabe, right? So like that would kind of be the end game. That's kind of 
what I would like to do. I'd like to maybe teach the language so actually um, dealing so much with the orthography and the written system. As helpful as that is, like I do think people are developing expertise in that. There's lots of linguistics people, but teaching the language while doing what you do anyways, right? I think that's, uh, I, Deb, you know me, I didn't even know that I was going to do a master's. Like, <laughs> so you put me on the spot. I'm like, I'm going to do something good and keep helping people. Like, that's what I got so far, and that's what's got me this far. So we shall see, right? Well, everyone's going to be looking forward to that. Um, yeah, so so hopefully, um, yeah, this is a lot of food for thought, actually. I have so many other questions, but probably people want to get on with their day. We said an hour, but but uh, um, I, do, I, I do want to thank you, because this is, again, a topic where a lot of dots need to be connected. What is it foundationally that communities need in order to be able to, you know, I call it self-determine their own climate change future. Like it, it's there, but you want to self-determine this yourself on your own terms rather than constantly be reacting to other people's solutions, right? And those solutions right now aren't necessarily making the connections in the way that you just described. Like actually people learning to take care of each other as Dan Longboat said is, you know, you have to take care of yourself and, and others and help each other and elders and youth also said that is actually key to, you know, meeting meeting um, the climate change challenge and that that doesn't often happen in these dialogues. So I think um, these kind of contributions are really important. These being able to connect a lot of these dots and you're one of the few people who's thought about this and, and written about it. So Jimmy Gwetch for uh, for joining us on this uh, conversation. I'm sure this is going to be <laughs> be used in a lot of contexts. And even as you're writing, like my page looks like this. There's so many things I want to talk to you more about <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of um, in terms of other work. So um, so if there's no other questions from folks, um, I just will just big um, Shmi Gwech to to Deb Pine for joining us and and hopefully we'll hear a lot more from her because she does like totally amazing work. I'm sure we will be. I think your voice is going to be like really important um, in the coming years, especially as even Indigenous communities and First Nation communities are trying to figure out what this Indigenous climate leadership is supposed to look like when it's kind of out there again in that abstract kind of way. But what does that what does that mean? It means that someone may be speaking to you in their language for 15 minutes, and that's the best way to convey what needs to happen or what is happening, right? And so it's really critically important. So awesome. So Jimmy Gretsch for bringing that to, to our attention. So again, thank you everybody for joining us and uh, hopefully you can enjoy the rest of your day. And again, if there's cool stuff you wanna to listen to again, it'll be posted on the IEJ website. Uh, Dali, if you're able to send, give people that information to the um, website, uh, then you'll see Deb Pine there and you can pause and you can speed up and so <laughs> at your leisure and listen to, to what she had to say about, um, about certain topics. So. Jimmy Gwetch for that. Awesome. Thanks, Deb. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye.